so welcome everybody to the medical assistance design panel discussion. Thanks particularly to Stan Grossman and Rabbi Cutler for putting together this outstanding panel. Uh, like everybody here, I'm really looking forward to the discussion and uh, learning together about a really important uh, issue for, uh, for a lot of us. Um, I am very quickly going to introduce the panelists, and I'll do it in the order that people are going to be presenting. Uh, I'm going to start with Dr. Karen Devon, who, which is the easiest for me because uh, Karen is a, yeah, because uh, Dr. Devon is a uh, surgeon in my department of surgery at Women's College Hospital. Uh, after receiving her medical degree at McGill University, Dr. Devon entered the general surgery training program and was awarded a master's of science in clinical epidemiology. She then completed a clinical fellowship in endocrine surgery at the University of Chicago, as well as a surgical ethics fellowship at the McLean Center for Clinical Ethics in Chicago. She's currently an associate professor and surgeon ethicist in the Department of Surgery at the University of Toronto and at the Joint Center for Bioethics in the Dalla Lana School of Public Health. She is a MAID assessor and provider and is the interim director of the MAID program at UHN. Dr. Devon is also the proud child of Holocaust survivors and lectures frequently to school and medical groups on the Shoah. Um, next, uh, Rabbi Dr. Rina Arshnal. Uh, following rabbinic ordination in 2008 at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, Rabbi Rina trained in hospital chaplaincy and became board certified as a chaplain with the Canadian Association for Spiritual Care. She also holds a certificate in bereavement education and a certificate in grief and trauma counseling. Prior to her rabbinical training, Rabbi Rina was a registered nurse in Montreal. She holds a bachelor's, in, a bachelor's of science from Concordia University and completed a master's in health science degree in epidemiology at the University of Toronto and worked for 20 years in clinical research. She is a board member of Neshama, the Association of Jewish Chaplains, and holds a PhD in palliative care from Lancaster University in England. She also volunteers with bereaved families of Ontario in the children's program and the infant loss program as a group facilitator and professional advisor. Rabbi Rina is an adjunct lecturer to the Faculty of Family Medicine at the University of Toronto. That's old. Sorry? It's old. Yeah. <laughs> The material I got to work with. Um, so, and uh, finally, um, the uh, third panelist in this outstanding panel is Dr. Ariel Berger, who is a geriatrician at University Health Network and Sinai Health System in Toronto, Canada. She went to medical school at Tel Aviv University and completed residency in New York City at Montefiore Medical Center and Mount Sinai Hospital. Her clinical work focuses on optimizing function and well being in older adults. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Yeah. And her scholarly work is devoted to understanding and enhancing physicians' ability to show up to work as their best selves. She has been developing, implementing, and studying the impact of a longitudinal curriculum for geriatrics residents on professionalism and related competencies since 2019. So um, thank you very much for the privilege of the introductions. And I'm going to hand over to uh, Rabbi Cutler, who is going to moderate the session. Welcome, everyone, and I'm glad that you're all here, and I'm glad that everyone who is joining us on Zoom, almost 100 of you, are joining us as well. I want to start by telling you what this evening is not going to be about. We are not going to be talking about what does Judaism have to say about medical assistance in dying, because... I just want to let you know to start, my conviction and the position of the entire conservative movement. Thank you. Fitting, I guess. <laughs> it's my position and that of the conservative movement that uh, a Jew is not permitted to um, allow oneself to have made, and a Jew is not permitted to administer made. So I just want to put that out there to begin with. So then why are we having this program at all? For me, the most important thing is that I want everyone who is here and this congregation to know that irrespective of your own medical decision making, that of your family, uh, I'm going to continue to be there as your rabbi. The last thing that I would ever want anyone in this community to think is, 
I'm doing something that I know the rabbi frowns upon, so I'm not going to reach out for the spiritual care that I deserve. I have been with people immediately prior to receiving MAID. I've spoken with families as they've dealt with the questions that come up around this issue. Sometimes people struggle with decisions that uh, other loved ones make. And I am there for that, uh, for that conversation. I'm there to hold your hand in whatever space that you need. And I know that's true of the entire clergy team here at Adam Israel. So if, that, if you learn one thing tonight from me, that's the thing I want you to learn. The worst time to think about MAID is at the moment that you have to make a decision with respect to MAID. I know there's not one specific moment, but when the crisis is upon you, that's the last time you want to start thinking your way through it. And so my hope is that this evening, you will have a chance to learn about the process. Uh, what does it entail? What are some of the questions that come up? I want you to hear what resources are available to you. There's also some challenges that we know that exist with respect to MAID uh, that I know we're going to hear about as well. Uh, what services are not present in Ontario that perhaps need to be in ways that they're there, but not the level that we really deserve. So I think I'm going to stop there and I'll let you know the order of the evening. So we're going to hear first from Dr. Devon, then Rabbi Dr. Arshinoff, and then Dr. Berger. Uh, they're each going to have about eight minutes to speak. Uh, after their time is up, uh, we're going to have a bit of a moderated conversation, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Sound good? Fantastic. Uh, so, Dr. Devon, uh, begin with you, and yes. if you could let us know what, what does MAID look like in 2023? I will. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, louder for... Should I hold it? They're saying they can't hear me. At least go up. Yeah, no, you don't have to it. Just hold it. Well, I can adjust the desk about me. It's fine, just leave it. No, no. Just the just fine. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm actually a member of Temple Sinai just down the road. Um, and so uh, I'm grateful to be part of a tradition where whether or not we agree on things, we can learn about them and discuss them, especially over cookies and coffee. Um, I'm gonna, you can't hear. That's, no one's ever said that to me before, <laughs> <laughs> ever. Hello, can you hear now? Okay, I'll, I'll just speak really loud. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so I was just, Great. I'm grateful to be here to be able to tell you a little bit about this. I've been, I've had the privilege of being a MAID provider since 2020. Um, David mentioned that my father was a Holocaust survivor, uh, which certainly, uh, you know, has, has always been on my mind as I do this work. Uh, and I should tell you that my father very well knew that I was doing this work and very much approved. Um, so I'm going to just Kind of go through the process of, of MAID um, and what it is and how one might access it. Um, most of the patients uh, who access MAID, 70% um, are patients with cancer, metastatic disease, um, end stage illness, but you do not have to be. Um, you still can't hear? Wow. Yeah, yeah just take it up.
here that is actually made hotline, 24 hour and phone line uh, that helps people access make requests. And there's also um, done in EDA, which can help people um, navigate the main system. Um, th there are all kinds of safe safeguards and processes that are put in place. So made often the, the process of requesting and then not being made um, is not particularly quick unless you're admitted to an acute care facility like where I am at UHN. Um, but it takes time. It requires two separate independent assessments uh, by physicians who um, are made assessors or made assessors providers like myself. Um, any physician can actually volunteer to be an aid um, assessor or to provide aid. My day job is surgery. This is not what I do uh, for most of the time. I treat thyroid cancers. Um, this is basically something I do on the side um, because um, I feel like it's meaningful work. Um, the request that the patient puts in has to be assigned the request with an independent witness. Independent refers to someone that does not have a um, financial connection uh, to the patient, so it's usually not a family member. It's not the owner of the facility where the patient resides. Um, in terms of what the criteria are, the original Supreme Court decision on uh, who is eligible for MAID um, it wasn't actually the government who decided they should have it or people that you know want the government to do this. It was actually the Supreme Court challenge of the criminal code. Um, and they determined that the blanket prohibition of assisted death did not was not consistent with the Canadian you know, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And so the what the Supreme Court said is that you have to have a previous and irremediable condition. And then the government and physicians further um, Sort of qualify that. And so in order to be approved for MAID, you have to have a serious disease. Um, and sometimes, um, like, like I said, 70% of the time uh, in, this, in this country and in this province, it's um, a cancer, but it can certainly be any serious disease. That disease has to be at an advanced state of decline. And the person has to have intolerable uh, enduring and intolerable suffering, and that's basically as defined for, by the patient. However, um, you know, when I do a MAID assessment, um, we actually do a lot of work exploring other options of the patient, making sure that they've considered, um, you know, anything that's available to them to relieve their suffering before they get approved for MAID. Um, the other logistics is you have to be at the moment 18 and over. Um, you have to have capacity. You have to absolutely understand what's going on. So MAID currently is not um, available as an advanced directive. A lot of people ask about MAID for Alzheimer's disease, for example. Um, and that is currently under consideration by the government, um, but currently not available. The request has to be voluntary. So another part of my job when assessing someone is to make sure that there has to be any pressure and or anything else, and to inform patients that they actually can withdraw the request at any time, whether it's when we see them for the first time or the second time, at the time of the procedure, or immediately before we administer the drugs. Um, it's actually very rare for people to withdraw their, their MAID requests. It's about 2% of anybody that's does not receive a MAID, and about 12% of patients die in close MAID. Um, so often they're at a very advanced state and it just their natural death occurs before the thing is made. Um, currently, I believe made is about 2% of all deaths in Canada. Um, what else can I tell you? So once, um, if someone is approved for me, um, they belong in either track, what we call track one or track two. Track one is for all patients in whom we deem that their death is reasonably foreseeable. Isn't a specific um, period um, for that definition, um, but the two assessors have to agree that this person is sort of close to a death, whether that's weeks or months, is you know up for some debate. Um, but it's usually pretty clear to us if you're in track one. If you're in track one, there are no other um, waiting periods or anything that needs to happen before the patient sort of chooses the the time and date and, and place of their death. 
Um, if you're in a product too, that means that your death is not reasonably foreseeable. So that would apply, for example, to a patient with ALS who has requested MAID and has been approved for MAID. And those, uh, that process uh, of requesting MAID for those kinds of patients, it often takes a lot longer. Um, but the minimum reflection period between the time that the patient is approved and the time that we can proceed and provide MAID for those patients is 90 days. Um, if your death is reasonably foreseeable, um, the government has just more recently changed the law to um, eliminate what was previously a 10-day um, waiting period, so there is no waiting period, um, and they've also changed the law that you can sign what's called a waiver of final consent. So normally, when I attend and, and proceed with MAID, I actually ask everyone to leave the room, the family members, and I would speak to the patient alone and make sure that indeed they want to proceed. Um, but there is no an option. So what was happening is people were actually declining the medication so that they could get to consent for MAID. And so now you can actually sign a waiver of final consent saying that if I should be, you know, um, just unable to completely consent on the day of it, you should proceed. I have to say, I've, I've gone through signing those consent quite often, but I've never yet had to enact, you know, performing aid when someone who wasn't completely uh, capable of making a decision in the moment. Um, you didn't want me to sort of describe the, the logistics, so the patient gets an IV. A couple more minutes. Okay. The patient gets uh, an, an intravenous uh, line, and then Whoever wants to be in the room, or whoever the patient wants to have the room, is not in the room. So they want anybody, so they have their family there. It's beautiful music. It's um, you know, it, it's, it's really quite personal. Um, from the time of starting the medications, the first medication gives us a sedative, it was first to sleep. And then after that, we give the remainder of drugs and so we and um, usually takes about five minutes to administer the drugs and for the person to die. Um, it can take up to 15 minutes. Um, it's absolutely painless uh, and very peaceful. Um, and I guess the only thing I'll say is that um, since I started in 2020, I have um, had several experiences providing aid to uh, Jewish patients and Jewish families. Um, and you know, I find this <clears throat> work to be extremely meaningful work for me, uh, but those cases have been even more meaningful. Um, and I've had, you know, some very memorable experiences. I've had people tell me it's an act of chesed. I've had people tell me I'm doing mitzvah. Um, I've had nothing but gratitude from patients and their families. Um, you know, I've had a patient ask me if they could go on Friday so they can have extra day at Benjamin's. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's, that's absolutely true. Um, and so, um, you know, it's really just very profound to be asked to God people in their final wishes um, of their life and to be there with their families. Thank you. Dr. Arshin, I'm going to ask you to go second, and we're going to try speaking right into the mic. So don't hold below your chin. No, straight. the opposite. No. Okay. <laughs> because the people on Zoom minutes. have a hard time hearing when we're projecting too much. Just get low. Like this? Yeah. <laughs> we're still working on this. <laughs> okay. Um, good evening, everybody. And um, thank you for inviting me to participate in this very, very important topic. Um, the little bio that was read out is. Um, on the old side, I should update the one that's on the internet. Um, but um, I am one of three rabbis working at Baycrest. And um, so my job is rabbi slash chaplain. And I always say, some days I'm more rabbi, some days I'm more chaplain. It depends on the day. And it depends on the time of year. So in two weeks, I'll be more rabbi. But um, it varies. Um, so working at Baycrest and, um, knowing that MAID is available to people does present some challenges. Um, 
Baycrest is a faith-based institution. It has hospital, a nursing home, and independent living. So the hospital is a place, including a palliative care unit, which I work with. Um, the hospital is not considered a place of residence, but Apotex, which is the nursing home, and the terraces, which is where people live independently, is the residence of each individual who resides there. So Baycrest has chosen to be a conscientious objector as a hospital because it is faith-based, um, just like St. Mike's faith-based. However, um, for people who are in Apotex or at the terraces, they are allowed to have made at Baycrest because that's their home. Mm -hmm. uh, for people who are in the hospital, um, and I have not yet been involved with anyone in the hospital who has requested made, um, they would have to either find a place where they could go, perhaps their own home that they once lived in, um, or a child's home, or I think maybe even a hotel. Yeah, um, but for for people who who, as I said, live in the terraces or in the nursing home, they are allowed to have made there. Um, something I would like to mention is a concept known as total pain. And this was developed by um, a very special person who was knighted by Queen Elizabeth, Dame Cicely Saunders. And this was in the 60s that she developed this in England. And Total Pain recognizes that people suffer in other ways than physical. Physical pain for sure, but there is also psychological pain social pain and spiritual pain. And this is something that um, I have seen many times over. And when people have this combination of all these challenges and all, and all the horrendous worries that they have, they are in absolute pain in so many different ways. Um, so, Mead actually has a very holistic um, approach. And we just heard from Dr. Devon um, how ho holistic it can be. Um, and people are very grateful for it. So I'd like to tell you, um, this, is, this is not easy for Baycrest um, because it is faith-based and because um, there have been so many queries about whether this is or is not allowed. Um, but um, about two years ago, all the nurses, and there are many, were asked to have as one of their ongoing in-service education, a session on May. And it was a full day. And um, various different people came and spoke to them about different aspects. And I was asked to come and talk about the spiritual component. For many nurses at Bakers, there are many, many nurses from the Philippines and many nurses from the Caribbean islands. They are very religious and um, have very mixed feelings about MAID and do they have to take part in taking care of somebody who has requested made. And many of them didn't even know some of the, you know, the, some of the, the events that led up to the legislation, um, as well as some of the logistics that Dr. Devin told us about. So I gave them a little bit of that. And then we did some role playing and I had the role playing all scripted out. And I asked for a volunteer to take part in one scenario in which a nurse would be absolutely disinterested and not willing to support the patient, and another nurse who had very mixed feelings, didn't really feel comfortable with me, 
but cared about her patient enough to support that individual. And the nurses learned so much from that role playing. And it was, it was a good lesson um, that we all learned that everybody needs to have the exposure. People need to learn about it. And so this is very wonderful that Abbott Israel is having this evening. So I'd like to tell you about um, some people, um, wonderful people who I have had the privilege of knowing, the privilege of working with. Um, there was a man, I, I got a phone call from a rabbinic colleague who asked me if I would be willing to support a particular man and his family. Um, he had a date for me, and, and then I was asked if I would officiate the funeral and support the family afterwards. And I said yes. And I went to where this man was. He was in a hospital setting. And I met him. And I met the family. And he was somebody who, at a too young age, had a terrible stroke and um, was dependent on other people to do everything for him. Um, the, the family, with the help of um, speech language pathologists, uh, developed a way of communicating with their fingers. And each finger was maybe three or four letters. So they would guess what he was trying to say. Is it red? Is it rapid? Is it, you know, they would try to guess what the word would be. Um, and I sat there wondering, what are they doing? But uh, there was such love in this family. It was absolutely palpable. And they told me everything about him and how you know, he had come to make this decision. He felt it was the decision that was right for him. He could not fathom. He was in his early 60s. He could not fathom another 25 or 30 years like this. He made the decision to donate his organs as well as his skin. And um, he, he wanted to give the most of himself, not only to his family, but from other people who he wouldn't ever know, but who could benefit from his death. Um, and so the they were very wonderful at this facility the night before everybody was asked to leave the family sort of waiting room and they set it up only for this family. They ordered some favorite food, they watched movies, they spent the whole night together in the room. And the next morning he had asked to, to be alone with the physician and uh, that the family wait outside. And um, everything he had hoped for took place. He, he had made, he died shortly after. He donated, the operating room was all ready for him. Uh, they harvested his organs. Um, the skin has to be um, harvested at the coroner's office. An ambulance was ready and waiting. And um, I appreciated it, you know. And- A couple minutes left. Oh, um, okay, that's probably the only person I'm going to get to speak to. Oh, I'll, I'll try one more. Um, and it was the most incredible, powerful, beautiful funeral I have ever witnessed. Um, and um, they sent me a beautiful, beautiful thank you card. So when I heard you talk about the gratitude, um, that that card, which I keep in my top drawer right next to me um, on my right side. And every so often I look at it, they included some photos and um, it's an experience that was very special. Special for him, special for the family, special for me. Um, and the one other person um, on my list 
um, who recently died was somebody who I had known for two years. Um, she was someone coming to one of the outpatient clinics. She had a terrible, terrible movement disorder. And if, if um, you're wondering what movement disorders are, Parkinson's is one of them. And she had, she had known quite long ago that she would choose me. And she had a friend who died uh, with maid and she was there and said it was so peaceful and so beautiful and that solidified her decision to do that and um i went to visit her um i didn't i don't go visit patients but this was a special relationship and i went to see her in her home 10 days before she died and she also planned everything. She wanted it exactly under a particular tree. Um, she decided who she wanted to be there and she donated her brain for research. Um, people are amazing. Um, there are other people I could talk about. We'd probably be here for about 45 minutes and I'm not allowed to do. <laughs> so I will pass it on to Dr. Herbert. Thank you so much. Um, I'm finding this quite emotional, actually. I um, have been a doctor practicing independently for about 10 years, but I feel that there's so much that I don't know every day about aging and certainly about dying. Um, before I talk about my direct experience with MAID, I just thought that I would discuss three key perspectives that I have that I bring to my thoughts about this idea. So first of all, um, in my professional life, I spend my days talking to and listening to older adults living with serious illness. And at that stage of life, there are so many things that I cannot fix. And so I spend my time trying to find what are the small things that I can do to make their day and their life just a little bit better. And trying to help them often identify what are the things in their life that are meaningful and how can we help them accomplish those things. And an experience that I have again and again is finding that many of my patients have built up so many internal barriers where they just, as their life has changed and they have aged, feel that they cannot do any of the things that they love to do. So for example, a woman who loves the theater but is so embarrassed to be seen with her walker that she just stays home. Or a man that I just saw, I just met him on Monday who coached um, bowling. I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> and his daughter's like, that's all we ever talked about. This was his favorite thing. And his license got revoked a couple of years ago and he didn't dare ask for a ride or take a taxi. He just doesn't do it anymore. And I bring this up because a huge concern that I have right now is our internalized bias in society against disability, that we have internalized so much in ourselves that once we don't look the way we wanted to or we thought we would, it's as if our life is meaningless and purposeless. And I find that really troubling in the context of MAID where often the reason people are requesting MAID is because of functional impairment. So that is a kind of cultural concern, I guess I would say, that I have. On the other side, the second perspective that I want to bring is that of a granddaughter of a 99-year-old grandfather who is the strongest person I have ever met. He survived the Shoah in Siberia. He escaped the 
um, communist uh, revolution in Hungary by foot. When he came to Canada as an immigrant, he, uh, as a refugee, sorry, he was uh, settled in, in Saskatoon and literally helped build the Saskatoon River Dam. And now at 99, he cannot stand by himself. He cannot take a step. You know, he, um, he had a hip replacement when he was like 92, I think. And he, he joked with all anybody who would listen that, you know, my bones, they lasted longer than any of my tractors. <laughs> he was a farmer also. So to see him sitting in a wheelchair by him, knowing that he is by himself for so much of the day, unable to do almost anything for himself is so painful. So I, I see the other side. <laughs> um, and that leads me, I guess, to my third perspective, which is my Jewish heritage and tradition, which I take very seriously and really informs the work that I get up and do every day. And I was thinking about this and thought of a line that we say in the Shema, before the Shema, sorry, in the morning. Um, God renews in God's goodness every day, always the act of creation, meaning, or one interpretation of this is that every moment, every day that the earth the universe is here. Every day that we are here, it's because God has willed it into being. And if that is the case, then our job is to figure out why am I here right now? And so one of the ways I do that is through my work and supporting my patients through very difficult diagnoses like dementia and by trying to find ways that I can to relieve suffering. Um, uh, but ending someone's life is not part of what I see as my role. So that's my background perspective. And I'll just tell you about my one um, experience with a patient who requested MAID. I've actually only had one patient request MAID directly from me. Um, she was a old lady, obviously. <laughs> the work that I do, who had Alzheimer's dementia. And um, she, because of her dementia, had really mismanaged her money. And it got to the point that she couldn't afford her rent anymore and was looking at having to move to a cheaper apartment or some other arrangement. And she told anyone who would listen that she would rather die than move. And uh, and that's what happened. She, I did not believe that she would be eligible for MAID when I made the referral. And I don't know, if I had known that she would be found eligible, I, I might have asked her to ask someone else to make the referral. Because like she had friends who loved her and who she loved. And they had a choir group that like connected on Zoom through COVID. And it just like she just she was still living a life, and it I just it it really haunts me that uh, this is what had to had to be. So, to end, I guess <laughs> I think one of the biggest points I would like to make, I guess, is that I really wish that we were spending our energy as a society and our resources and our imagination on how, trying to figure out how we can help people live. How do we support the people who are elders, right? Who deserve to live in dignity when so many of them are not getting the care that they need. Um, and I, I, yeah, I wish that we could have that conversation as well. <laughs> well thank you. I'm gonna ask everyone here to just take a deep breath. Yeah. <laughs>
earliest uh, Devar Torah, Devar Tzfilah that I actually remember hearing was on that exact line before the Shema, and you were in the room with me. So that's hilarious. Dr. Berg and I go back many, many years. And so I'm wondering, maybe it lodged there. I guess so. <laughs> Another Benjamin story. Um, it was a Wednesday, and I got a call from Benjamins. And they asked me if I was available to officiate at a funeral the next Wednesday. Check my schedule. I was. And I asked, um, you know, because it's, it's irrelevant for me as the rabbi, you know, is there a reason for the delay? You know, we know usually Jews were trying to bury as soon as possible. Which the response was almost verbatim, oh, she's not scheduled to die until two o'clock on Tuesday. <laughs> and I just had to take a bit of a, a deep breath because that was my introduction, so to speak, uh, to this process. Um, since that time, I've had other families and other individuals who I've known um, who've made this decision for themselves, and um, it gets normalized, uh, which is, of course, what on one hand you want, and on the other hand, um, it becomes challenging because I think all of us here you want to see that person in front of you, right? Like, you know, rabbis can joke, you know, you know, you have four funerals that week. It's like, oh yeah, I got four people, you know, buried this week, but it's not, there were four people who were buried that week. And each of them had their own spark of life. And I imagine there's a challenge there and for every person and every step of the process to see that human being in front of them and not just, you know, a, a box to check uh, someone you have 15 minutes to assess and then moving on. I'm going to start with you, Dr. Devon. I was, I'm hoping that you can speak a little bit toward the, the current conversation about MAID and mental health. Because it, it's in the news and it's one which is, I, I want to hear more about Yeah. Definitely dominating the news right now. Um, so um, I guess when MAID was introduced, as I mentioned before, um, basically it was just an amendment to the criminal code that no longer pro prohibited assisted death. And when they did that, they did that? Or, yeah. And when they did that, um, <laughs> they the, it was the government that <clears throat> imposed a reasonable foreseeable death or a terminal illness. And then there was another challenge um, in 2019 um, that, um, it, and it was determined again at the, in the high courts that the way that the government um, had started to do made by imposing that was discriminatory and that we should not have a blanket prohibition on a diagnosis um, because everyone has the right to be considered for made. And so that is actually, um, and, and so, and since then, um, there have been delays in um, kind of allowing MAID to proceed for patients who have mental illness as their sole diagnosis. So if someone has metastatic carcinoma and they have a history of depression, that may play into our MAID assessment, of course. Um, I, I should tell you that every MAID patient I've ever assessed is not depressed. Um, but, um, but until now, no one has been considered for MAID where mental illness has been the, the only reason um, for consideration. Um, and that they've just got another extension because it's obviously a very, very complex issue to try and sort out. Um, so this will not be uh, in place until at least May of 2024. Um, they're doing a lot, the government is doing a lot of consultations with you know, various stakeholders um, and, and professionals and experts to try and kind of figure that out. But it's actually not an expansion of the MAID law. It's actually just, um, you know, trying to make what we're doing commensurate with the Supreme, with the original decision. I think that um, it's going to be extremely complex. There's questions about, you know, incurability. What does that mean in mental illness? 
Um, there's questions about irre irreversibility. Uh, we may know that for certain cancers, but do we know it for, for mental illness? Uh, questions about capacity. And of course, um, questions about how to differentiate between what we think of as suicidality, so an impulsive um, instinct to want to die, versus a rational request for mate. So I think it's going to be very, very, very complex. Um, but um, it, it, you know, the the constitutional experts have decided that this is within people's rights, and so we're going to have to um, figure out a way to provide the safeguards um, and all the processes that might allow that to happen safely. And I think um, to Dr. Berger's point, I think that, you know, I strongly advocate for any and all social services, um, mental health services, you know, affordable housing, you know, income support, you know, all of those things are super, super, super important. And in fact, I can't do my job without them. I have to offer patients what their alternatives are. And if I can't offer those alternatives, I can't do an appropriate assessment. I have to tell people the things that they should be considering um, when they're making requests. And so um, I think all of those things, you know, I stand with anyone fighting or advocating for better care, but I also think that um, we can't hold people who are suffering hostage to kind of the failings of our society, unfortunately. Uh, and for how long, you know? And I, the other thing is made um, with respect to palliative care at the beginning, um, there was a lot of concerns about access to palliative care. And we've actually learned that access to palliative care has improved um, since May started because there was so much concern um, that the law would be passed and people who didn't have access would just go up and made. Um, that there was a huge amount of um, investment into palliative care. And, and recently, there have been studies that have shown that actually in Canada, surprisingly through the pandemic, um, palliative care, most of the measures that the, there's a, the Canadian government basically made a new framework for palliative care in 2017, May started in 2016. Um, and then most of those quality indicators, things have actually improved since the advent of, or since the kind of introduction of yeah. I was struck, Dr. Berger, by the, the focus on language around disability and seeing ourselves as you know, my identity being bound up in one's productive work, right? Whether that's coaching bowling or whatever profession you might have. And then if that stops, uh, there's a question of, of selfhood at that moment. I believe that you are cross-appointed within psychiatry and, and, and geriatrics. Not at all. That's what your bio on the website says. It's, it's like, I, I check. I do. I work with a psychiatry team. Okay. I'm not the psychiatrist. Um, and I, I know we have at least one head of psychiatry in the audience today. Um, how much involvement is there with psychiatrists specifically? Um, I know the assessors don't have to be my understanding is a lot of psychiatrists are hesitant to be uh, to actually administrate the drugs. Um, where do the psychiatrists play a role? I am going to defer that question because I actually don't know to Dr. Um, and... <clears throat> I mean, I guess it's done. It's okay. Um, at, at my institution, uh, we actually do have psychiatrists on the MAID uh, team. They aren't providers, they are assessors. Um, but it's not specifically because they're psychiatrists. Um, we don't ask them to assess patients, um, you know, in particular situations. They're just assessors who agree to be made assessors. I think certainly there's a huge, when we get back to the mental health issue, um, within psychiatry, there is a lot of um, debate and concern and difference of opinions um, all across the spectrum. So you can, not, not everyone agrees, surprise, surprise. Um, and I think that, you know, they will obviously, with respect to um, when mental illness, you know, becomes a sole indicator, can become um, a sole indicator for a request, they're going to have to um, very much be involved because of their expertise. Currently, if your death is not reasonably foreseeable, you, one of your assessors or an additional assessor has to be someone with expertise in the disorder. So for example, if I'm asked to assess someone with a neurologic disorder and their, their death is not reasonably foreseeable, 
I need to make sure that someone has seen them who is an expert in their disease. I don't have to be the expert in their disease, but there's a lot of consultation that happens. I guess I'm wondering also, like, how often would you involve psychiatry to, like, do you have questions about people's capa capacity and making the decision? <clears throat> Again, um, you know, I, I'm, it might be unique where I work. I work in a acute care hospital, and um, actually, the decisional capacity, uh, generally physicians uh, usually make that with respect to the decision that they're asking a patient um, to make. I think, again, if we had concerns about someone with a psychosis that was requesting made, we might involve specifically as a consult service, a psychiatrist, but in general, um, you know, it's often very clear um, that there's decisional capacity. But of course, when there's any concerns or questions, um, there's a lot of conscientiousness that goes into this. I know the people that do this work, um, first of all, nobody wants to go to jail, and that is what we're liable for if we screw up. Um, and, um, and so there's always a lot of, you know, effort and consultation. Um, it's not like we just, you know, it, it, you're, it struck me that you talked about sort of seeing a person um, versus sort of ticking the boxes. And although the boxes do need to be ticked, I think, you know, I really have no doubt that myself and my colleagues are, are really um, seeing people. And in, and in some ways, most of my work is almost trying, I mean, I don't, my aim is not to convince people not to have me, but I need to be that sure that they're not convincible, you know, um, that, it, that it really is the means to end their suffering. And, um, you know, that also speaks to when you talked about why I'm here, I thought that passage was very meaningful. And in fact, I've had patients ask me to recite the Shema, um, you know, during administration or right before. Um, and so I also think about why I'm here and, um, you know, I'm here to care for people and to help them. I'm definitely not here to end lives. I'm here to help them with their suffering. So I couldn't go to work every day if I thought I was going to work for lives. I have a, a lot of questions, a lot of stories, um, but I'm, I'm going to hold off on them because I'm hopeful that you'll answer my emails later on. Um, and I'm going to open it up to the floor to hear your primarily questions. But if you need to preface it with a two to three sentence comment, <laughs> I am listening for the periods and counting at the ends of those sentences. <laughs> and please stand up. And for those of you who are on Zoom, you're not going to be able to hear the question. I will repeat it. I just want to be clear. Uh, if someone has cognitive issues, has either dementia or Alzheimer's, and having experienced this both with my mother and my mother-in-law, my understanding is the person has to give, has to authorize this procedure. If the person is beyond the point where they have control of their faculty, is there anything at the moment that they can do prior to that? Or is there any procedures involved where they can secure maids currently? And if I can go further, with this legislation that was supposed to come in March 31st of this year, that was just quietly going along until the Global Mail put an article about it, and all of a sudden it became something of an issue. So the government typically postponed it for a year. Would that, under those conditions, would that be allowed if that legislation had passed in March 31st, 2024? So the question, which I think is directed to you, Dr. Devon, has to do with cognition and particularly Alzheimer's and the ability or, or non-ability to give advanced directives essentially uh, to allow for MAID. So if a patient um, has a dementia um, and they are um, at the end stage of another incurable or a, another illness um, and requests MAID and, are, and is still has the capacity to make most of their healthcare decisions, they can access MAID. Um, you were correct in what you said, which is that um, if the patient loses that decisional capacity um, for 
daily decisions or decisions specifically around their health. There's currently no way for someone to make an advance request for MAID, whether it's an advance request for a few months from now or from 10 years from now, and detail in which situation they might think that they would want um, to have MAID. Um, and the legislation that is um, being worked on, they're definitely looking at this issue, but it's, I don't think, very close to being determined. Um, I actually personally find that the issue with dementia is in some ways much, much more complex than the one of uh, when we discuss mental illness. And because in mental illness, uh, I feel like my kind of main principle, my moral principle is respecting some agency and autonomy. Um, and I don't think we should be taking that away from people. Um, with dementia, I think it's extremely difficult to think about um, ourself in a different state and then to determine whether or not that state is a state of suffering. Because to me, the key is not whether you get to make a decision in advance. The key is whether you are, one of the criteria is that you are intolerant of suffering. And so when, and we've all had, had experiences, family experiences with patients with dementia, and when you go to visit a patient, you no longer recognize you, but it's uh, quietly clapping with music. Um, it's very hard, and I think it would be very hard for physicians to say, is that patient intolerably suffering? Um, now you guys can't, yeah. It's a balance. It's a balance. Okay. Um, and so I think that is one of the, you know, really major, major issues. Um, and on the reverse side of that, if the patient has Let's say we are we get to a point where there's advanced directives, and a patient has said, you know, when I'm in this particular state, uh, please provide me with MAID. And then theoretically, we try, and the person somehow physically or or verbally or something dissents from what you're about to do. I mean, how could we possibly proceed? And so I think, you know, some of the things that you mentioned um, just the idea of selfhood and dignity and whatnot. I think the dementia and advanced uh, directives is actually much, much more complex than when you have a patient in front of you who, can, who presumably can actually make a decision. I don't know if you are. The only, yeah, one more thing I was going to add is that um, one of the challenges with providing advanced consent is that I believe there's a lot of evidence to show that actually we're more resilient than we think we are. And many, many people may have imagined that they would be suffering and that their life would not be worth living should they become in X state. And then that happens and they say, actually, I'd like to see tomorrow. So we're actually very bad at predicting how we will feel in the future. So I think that's also really important. I'd like to add something, oops, I'd like to add something as well about family members. Um, and that is um, somebody can feel that the suffering is just no, no longer tolerable and will go ahead and perhaps not even mention to their children or if there's a spouse, um, that they um, make the request and then they get assessed. Um, so I know a lady who was quite certain that this was what she was going to do. And she finally told her two children. And one of the children begged his mother, please don't do it. He could not understand. And it's very difficult to understand someone else's suffering um but because she saw the pain that he was in she changed her mind and uh, there's one other thing i want to just mention um and something i learned right from the beginning of my chaplaincy training illness has a way of taking someone's control and out the window it goes and something we all want and need is control we need control in our lives. And MAID has been able to provide some control to people who feel that 
it, they just can't go on. And so even making the request, even asking questions about it, and then going through the assessment, it doesn't mean that everyone is going to go ahead and, and have the procedure, but it's amazing how different somebody can be when suddenly they have had some, some control given back to them. And that's important to remember. Your story about the sun is the right prompt for me to share um, the opposite. And this is a, a real call that I had within the last few weeks. Uh, in hindsight, the truthfulness of the call, I want to say, is suspect. But the situation itself can, I'm sure, already has many times already um, arisen. A woman is uh, was treated for being treated for cancer and was actually seemingly improving. And the story that, as the way I heard it, her daughter says to her, Ma, you know, you've had a pretty good life. We can see what your next while will look like. Both me and my brother, you know, we could really use the money. It would be better off for everyone if you were to consider me. I hear this story from the brother who only heard it because the PSW told him. Again, the truthfulness of the story that is suspect, but this can happen. And I, I worry, and I don't know if this needs a response because we have more questions. Um, People and parents in particular are really easy to manipulate. And in this case, you had one caring child and one child less caring. And when it's only one child and there's only one person, only one step, I fear that, you know, it's not so hard to trick to assessors because you don't want to disappoint the one person you've been trying not to disappoint for a long time. So that's just sort of the contra story uh, oh, to your story. Sure, certainly is. Uh, so we have a few hands up. Go ahead, sir. Question. I've instructed my doctor, Mark on my uh, form at his office, that I want assisted death when the time comes when I have no quality of life. Question. Are there forms that I can sign right now that will eliminate anybody else's opinion as to what I want? Pretty quick answer. Not at the moment. There, there's no, um, you know, even if we're not talking about assisted death, even if we're just talking about, you know, you being in a scenario you're at, where you're at the end of life, um, your substitute decision maker or power of attorney sometimes if it's done legally, but ultimately uh, the most important thing actually that can arise other than knowing that your rabbi is available for you is to talk to your family about death and about what you would want, about what they would want. That is actually the most important thing because um, when you're in a state where you do not have decisional capacity, it is not going to be up to you to decide no matter what legal forms you have ever signed in your life. Um, that That's the case, not just with MAID, but in general. And so it's just really, really important to have these discussions with your family or no, with or with not, the people that have, you know, the, yeah. Um, but, there, but there are no, there is, there, there are no uh, legal documents that will make sure that you have an assisted death now or in the near future. Uh, very back of the room. Uh, it's very concerning to me because I think it's the exact same as two other gentlemen talked about it. Because I watched my father suffer from early onset dementia at the age of nine, and suffered for 10 years. And I was very little, <laughs> very little to me. Um, and so I think that it's 
yes, I think you can talk to your children about it and say, if I am diagnosed with Alzheimer's, I don't want to use biotics, I don't want, you know, I, if I get to this stage, I don't want uh, uh, treatment. And uh, But I myself am the same as this gentleman where I'm actually thinking of going to a lawyer's office, even though I'm a lawyer myself, going to a lawyer's office, doing an advanced directive and say, okay, let's take a stab at an advanced directive. And when it you know, happens earlier than it legislated, mm -hmm. that perhaps that document could be grandfathered in because at that time I have total capacity now. So can I say, but- I Is there a question yeah. coming? <laughs> sorry? Is there a question? The question is, sorry, that if I, if you're, you're not allowed to, because, and, but at the time when you're diagnosed, you may have already lost them. So the concern is that exactly what you said. So my question is, is do you think that, can you envision that in the future, that if people do want to do that at best, right, to not tell their doctor, but talk to a lawyer and say, not just a living will, because it's living wills too that, that provide that you don't want a certain, if you're at the end of life, what you want. But you, can you foresee that that could possibly be legal? Or grandfathered in the future that if somebody did an advanced directive saying that if they were so the questioner was, is asking about the foreseeability of uh advanced directives and particularly in the case of uh dementia and an inability at the moment to consent um again it's, it's not been similar to the previous questions um the government is looking at this i don't know the answer i don't think anyone really knows the answer um I personally am concerned about uh, trying to judge other people's suffering as much as we might think we see suffering. Um, it's very difficult when someone doesn't have capacity to tell us that themselves. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dwash. Thank you. I'm my name's I'm by, uh, oh. uh, the other Dr. Dwash. Yeah. Like, I know it. Yeah. So Not the end of the few. Yeah. few us. Um, Thank you, uh, all three of you, uh, for coming. You know, I'm an intensive care physician by practice, and, and these issues, uh, medicine in many areas is a messy business um, where, you know, doing what's right and, and what's just and, and what's ethical and what's moral it is, is, is a challenge, and that's 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 the calling to, to, to do right for your patients. And, and I commend all three of you. Uh, I do have a question. I have lots of opinions on this. I'm not going to share any of them. But my question is about consent. And uh, in Ontario, the age of consent is there is no age of consent. It is assumed uh, implied consent for, for all ages. Um, I know there's for me there is a an age cutoff, but that will be challenged. There, there are challenges going through, and at some point, because of discrimination. It will, it will be addressed. And you know, it goes with this, the question of the slippery slope uh, in terms of, you know, do, do we do it for soul mental illness? Do we do it for non-criminal disease? Do we allow uh, adolescents? Do we allow children? What is the age of capacity? And what age, uh, or should there be an age at which uh, uh, a person, because children are people, um, should, uh, be allowed or not be allowed uh, to consent because again, specifically on, in Ontario, there is there is no age of consent. A newborn baby is assumed capable. Um, so, your thoughts for anyone? So the questioner uh, it works in the ICU as a physician and is asking about age of consent. Uh, specifically in Ontario, uh, right now there is a, a minimum age at which uh, someone has to be in order to request made and uh, and receive it. What what again? What does the future hold for this? And what are your concerns about a thirteen year old and a ten year old and their own suffering? Um, I'm going to take a stab at this. Um... I'm, I'm currently studying bioethics, same program that um, our esteemed scholar here has graduated from. Um, currently, um, this is being discussed. And um, so for mature minors um, who 
have the capability of understanding not only the disease that they have, but what the implications are of MAID. Um, uh, they, it's possible that they could um, consent because they can consent for other things. And um, like a 14 year old can consent to have an abortion without her parents um, providing their consent as well. So that is being looked at and compared um, in, uh, with respect to MAID. Um, there are two countries in Europe, Belgium and um, Spain. Is it Spain? Netherlands. Netherlands. Belgium and the Netherlands. Um, that, um, that does allow for mature minors to give consent for MAID in... Um, Belgium, there's a psychiatrist on the team, and um, and the the child has to see the psychiatrist, um, and and they differ a little bit in 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 assessing um, the uh, the young person here in Ontario or in uh, Ontario there is no age as you say there is no age, um, so it is a slippery slope. So then, what happens? with the parents? How are the parents going to um, receive this when their child says that they want MAID? Um, and that will vary from one family to another, depending on the family, depending on the illness that, that they're discussing and, um, and what the legislation is at the time. Um, it's going to be difficult, for sure. I'll just add that um, my understanding of the, the the expert testimony that has gone on thus far around mature minors um, has basically focused on terminal illness, so they will not be a non-foreseeable death uh, track, um, and it actually has also focused on parental assent, so I don't think there are going to be situations where um, a child and their parents disagree um, at the end of some terminal illness uh, of their request for MAID that will be approved. Again, that was just, we haven't, they haven't done the legislation yet. Um, currently, just to be clear, it's 18 or over. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Yes. So uh, my question has to be the topic of, of voluntary consent versus coercion and Canadian doctors' obligation to initiate a topic of MAID in certain situations. And so how do we know that when the doctor initiates the topic that and, and the patient decides to proceed with me, how do we know that that decision was because the doctor initiated the topic relative to patients having access to the topic but not doctor initiated? The questioner was asking about uh, who brings up the subject of MAID and whether if the physician is the first person to bring MAID into the room, whether that could be seen as a form of coercion, as a, a treatment option, so to speak. Um, I'm going to channel the kind of more medical questions. Um, I think it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I, not to be flippant, but I think you could also wonder if someone agrees to chemotherapy, why they're agreeing to chemotherapy. Is it because the doctor brought it up and then they have a complication with chemotherapy, or you see me as a surgeon and I tell you to have your thyroid at. So I think we all, uh, you know, as physicians, have, you know, a kind of a vested interest of some sort. Um, I do feel that um, in appropriate situations, physicians have an obligation to provide you with all of your potential options in that situation. I think if you came to the hospital with appendicitis and someone said, hey, what about MAID? Um, that would be inappropriate and criminal and uh, you know, uh, just not something that, that should happen. On the other hand, um, if you're talking about the end of life or you're at the end stage of illness and talking about palliative care, I think providing you um, something like, you know, some people um, wish to discuss the option of assisted death. Is that something you'd like to hear about? I think that's absolutely reasonable and not coercive. 
Um, and just to sort of comment on the situation that the rabbi brought up uh, about coercion from family, um, you know, obviously you're right. I mean, I, I can't imagine that no one would ever, ever, ever be able to get by my spidey senses. That being said, um, in practice and in speaking to all of my colleagues around the country who do this work, um, what we encounter much, much, much more frequency, frequently are patients who are being uh, pressured, bullied, or coerced away from Maine. That is what I see in practice. Uh, I'm not suggesting that, I mean, one of the criteria that I have to make sure to the best of my ability is that the person isn't being coerced towards Maine. Um, but, but again, um, in all situations, I'm supposed to do that when someone agrees to any therapy that they're seeing me for, whether it's oncologic therapy or, en or any other therapy. So, um, you know, I think these are things that are important to think about and to, you know, obviously create a rigorous system that, um, hopefully people don't, you know, we don't make errors uh, around. Um, but, but I don't think that those situations are, are the norm. So a hand up from my mother, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Um, actually, my question pertains to what you were speaking of. I imagine that the situation of families not supporting the main decision comes up frequently. And I'd like to know, how do you counsel those families? I, I guess that's more of a question to the rabbi. A question for the rabbi. <laughs> how, the yes, how, how, how do you counsel families who do not support their relative who has an information request? Um, microphone. Um, it's a challenge for sure. Um, and, you know, some, I, I think the probably the most important initial question is what are you afraid of? Um, the reality is that we are afraid of death. We don't want to talk about death. We don't want to think about our parents or our spouse or our children or siblings or friends dying. Um, so to get that out um, first and foremost is really important. Um, and then to, to say, you know, how do you see, like say it's a parent, how do you see your father um, coping with, with life right now? What is important, what has been important to him? And what, what is it like now? Um, there are some illnesses such as Parkinson's, um, which I did my PhD in, um, where there is one loss after another, and it's a slow um, process of losses. Um, and it's very painful for people watching them. Um, initially, families, and I remember working with somebody's wife who went, <gasps> What do you mean? What do you mean? And he said, I think you need to go to Rabbi Rina's office and spend some time with her. Because he, he knew it wasn't unexpected for him that she would react that way. And, um, and after several conversations with her, she was able to understand um, what, what, life was like for him and why he was asking for maid. That doesn't mean that she was happy to make that, you know, agreement to understand um, or that she, you know, was, was relieved about it, but she had appointments made with me and she came for each one. And um, so it will be different for for every situation, um, but tell me about your life. Tell me about your relationship with this person. What will it be like for you? Is, is that what you're afraid of? You're, you're not going to have this person in your life. Um, have you thought about that before? And, um, and then talk about all the various different changes that are going to happen. Like someone's going to be alone in the bed. Someone will come home and there won't be that person 
to say hello to. What are you doing? Where are you? Um, you know, just the everyday things that we take for granted become huge. And the more people talk and the more they can try to understand, and understand is a loaded word, but uh, try to get some kind of an inkling as to what life has become like for the person. Um, some people are able to understand it, some are not. Like, you know, the, the example I spoke about before of the man who, um, like the one who donated his organs, his family was so incredible and they saw the suffering that he was going through and they were sad, they were really sad, but they understood that he couldn't handle it anymore. He couldn't cope. And so for his sake, they did everything they could to make his last period of time meaningful and that they found a rabbi who they felt comfortable with. Can I, I wanna pick up on the organ donation piece because I did a little math. Um, and my math, it's it simply infinity equals infinity. And by, by that, I mean, I, my fear is that someone is in a situation and they look at themselves and this ties into what Dr. Berger is speaking about being productive or contributing to society in some way and sees themselves, they say, okay, if I do this now, I can donate my kidneys, my liver, my cornea, and I can save this many lives, right? And, but obviously in so doing would end my own life. Or I can wait and see what the progression of my disease is. And in six months from now, maybe I'll die naturally, maybe by then I can make another made decision, but my organs are likely to be in a state where I can't donate them. Right. And again, another fear of mine is to say, well, if, you know, I'm just one and I can save six. So why shouldn't I just do that, right? If, if we're thinking strictly in terms of utilitarian uh, like philosophy, like that makes sense, that's an answer. But that's why my math was infinity equals infinity. Because I think you know, from a traditional Jewish perspective, you know, one person's life is equal to the entire universe, right? right. And you can't save other people's lives and think that that somehow equals your own death. Um, so, you know, is, is this something which comes up in conversation? That I happens? have I have never yet met somebody who has expressed donating their organs in that utilitarian way. Um, I mean, that's great. You know, if we think of utilitarianism, then the more people who are helped, then the better. And we know that we have a big gap in availability of organs. But I have never heard, in my experience, anybody say that, and I'm not sure if you have, um, but people who make the decision about need will talk about donating organs, but I don't think such, it, it's a chicken and egg. I, I don't think, at least I can only talk about what I have encountered, um, everyone I have encountered um, has thought about the organ donation afterwards and the maid first. But maybe you can enlighten us. Yeah, um, I've been involved in two uh, maid organ donations at the hospital. Um, I agree with you that organ donation never comes up during the maid, um, initial maid assessment. To be honest, most patients who access MAID are not eligible to be organ donors based on the nature of their disease. Um, and the ones who are um, certainly, um, you know, are very pleased to be able to do so. Um, I think that for me, the focus is on a person's autonomy. Um, and that if we say you have the right to smoke and drink, um, then you have the right to make decisions about uh, the way in which you want to die in a serious, irremediable illness where you are intolerably suffering. And whether that's in two months or two months earlier or two months later, um, doesn't concern me quite as much. We do have a 
and I'll uh, slip, allow, allow a comment to slip through from Zoom. A uh, comment is from Jeff Myers. He is a Bresler family chair in end of life and made at U of T and a palliative care physician. And he just wants to emphasize that the vast majority of people who request made are very near the end of their life. Most people who request made don't do so under problematic circumstances. Uh, we have time for one more question. And we have one more hand up. Simple question. Are all mass bricks of made covered by owner or is there out of pocket expenses? Uh, is made covered by OHIP? You actually, one of the criteria is that you have to be eligible for public funding in Canada, so OHIP or other um, provinces. Uh, so Canada does not allow any kind of made tourism cannot come to Canada as a visitor and access made. There are other countries where you can do that. That's an, actually an excellent question. Um, but yes, the entire thing uh, is indeed OHIP covered. Including the drugs if you choose to do this at home? Yes. Interesting. Because the other drugs aren't. Yeah, I think this is the big, I'm, I'm very worried about the financial implications of this and a person looking at their life and at the out-of-pocket cost of being cared for at end of life, which is astronomical, and deciding that I don't want to put my family through that burden, and so I will die instead. And that to me is just horrific. I think as a society, it is insane that we can cover this and you can get it within, you know, two weeks to be assessed and you can't get basic care at home. Um, again, I tend to agree with you on that. I agree that uh, we don't provide enough assistance and support in society, um, but I think that it's completely separate uh, issue that's inflating the argument about this. One of... One of the things that I do as a rabbi, um, sometimes on behalf of someone, if they don't have the capacity, or sometimes with the individual, usually with their family around, uh, when they are in their final days, weeks, uh, as we do something called the Bidui, uh, the Jewish confession. And there is a hope there that uh, through their own death, um, they somehow clear the air of anything that they have done wrong in their own lifetime. And the, the central piece of the Bidui is of course the Shema. And it's evening time. Uh, we are commanded to recite the Shema in morning in the evening. And while this is an educational program, I think we all feel the weight of it in this room. And so I'm just, I'm gonna say the Shema and if, you want to join along with me, you are certainly welcome to do so. Shema Yisrael, I want to thank uh, the three of you uh, for taking time out of, I know you're all very busy people. Um, some of you getting more degrees, some of you taking care of children, and some of you I don't know you as well. <laughs> but I'm sure you do lots of things. Thank you to your children too. <laughs> um, and just thank you for, for being here and, and for teaching us and sharing uh, your expertise and your knowledge this evening. It has been uh, a really important program and I'm glad that all of you were able to be here for it. Uh, there is another community program coming up uh, offered by Tor in Motion on similar titles. So some free promotion for them. If you're interested, you can grab a flyer. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you for being here.